Well, how many of you have ever tried to put a piece of furniture together without using the instructions? Yes, a couple of you are willing to admit it. The rest of you are like, oh, I don't do that. Yes, you do. Don't lie to me. It is like the world's worst puzzle, and I bring it upon myself because I'm the kind of person that instantly throws the instructions away, and then I get frustrated and have questions like, why are there 26 bolts and only five holes to put them in? And I have questions like, who in their right mind thought that putting together an entire bed frame with an Allen wrench was ever a good idea? Well, my sophomore year of college, I decided... I was going to get a futon, and I was so excited because I was going to have a large couch in my dorm room. It was going to be amazing, and so I go purchase it from Walmart. I bring it to my dorm room. I rip the box open. First thing I do is throw the instructions away because it's a futon. How hard can it be to put together? And for the next three hours, I slave away at putting this thing together, and as I'm getting close to being done, I look down, and along with the other 25 bolts that I haven't used, there's a leg. I'm like, what does this go to? Well, I look at the instruction, or I look at the, the picture. I'm like, well, I don't see it on the picture, so I don't know. Maybe it's like if a leg falls off, you're supposed to be able to put this on there. Didn't see anywhere to put it, so I tossed it in the trash can. Well, what I didn't know was that some futons, because they're poorly made, have to have a leg in the middle to support it. And I threw that support away. So the first time that my roommate brought five of his soccer buddies over and they all piled onto the couch, it started to get a little V-shape in it. They didn't notice it. It wasn't too bad at first. But over that school year, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse until the point that the only way you could sit comfortably on it was to sit all the way on the edge because if you sat in the middle, you sunk eight inches down. So naturally, at the end of the school year, I throw it away because what am I going to do with the broken couch? And a buddy of mine, as I'm carrying out the dorm room, he stops me and he goes, hey, you know that's supposed to have a middle leg, right? <laughs> well, I do now. A little late for that nugget of advice, isn't it? It's going in the garbage. And I remember I was so frustrated with myself and so disappointed. I never got to experience that futon to the fullest extent because I put it together wrong. It was my fault. But as I was thinking about that story the other day, it got me to thinking about what if that was true of our relationship with God? What if there was something that could keep you from getting the most out of your faith simply because you were doing it wrong? Well, I want to unpack that question today as we continue in our series, Strong, looking at the judges. And we're going to be looking at Samuel today. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can turn to 1 Samuel 7, and we're going to look at the first two verses together real quick. It says, so the men of Kiriath-Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord, and they brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill, and they consecrated Eleazar, his son, to guard the ark of the Lord. The ark remained at Kiriath-Jerim a long time, 20 years in all, then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So what's happening here is the beginning of this chapter is a direct continuation of the ending of chapter 6, where the Philistines have decided they want to return the ark of the covenant to Israel. Now, you may be wondering, how did the Philistines get the ark? I thought the ark was supposed to stay in the tabernacle in Israel. And if you thought that, congratulations, you're correct. But what you also have to remember is that this is when Israel is at a point and a process, what we call the sin cycle. And so a reminder of what that is, is that they would sin, they would be taken over by a foreign nation, they would cry out to God, God would give them a judge to deliver them, and after a certain time of peace, they'd go right back to it. So by the time we get to 1 Samuel 7, they have already had 11 judges. So they are kind of the kings of making bad decisions. So what happens is, is they turn away from God again, and the Philistines go, we're attacking again. But they get this bright idea in their head. They go, okay, so we know that God's not on our side, but we have the ark, and the ark is God's presence. So if we just take the ark into battle we'll win. What could go wrong? Well, they lose that battle, and thousands of their men are slaughtered, and the Philistines steal the Ark of the Covenant, and the glory of the Lord departs Israel. And so naturally, the Philistines 
They were excited about this. So they would take it to their towns and they would parade it around. But what they found was that every city that the ark made its way to experienced disease and devastation. So they get smart. They say, well, if it happened here, just take it to another city. So they take it to another city, disease and devastation. Take it to another city, disease and devastation. And they did this over and over again until finally they realized what the common denominator was. And they said, we don't want this thing. Give it back to them. So Israel goes at the end of chapter 6 to get the ark, and that's where we pick up in our story. And they try to do the right thing here. They don't take the ark back to the tabernacle, but what they do is they put it in the house of Abinadab, and they take his son, and they appoint him as a guard over it, and then they actually begin to worship God again. So in their mind, everything is supposed to go back to normal here. But Israel, they don't experience prosperity. And they don't experience deliverance from the Philistines. Instead, their situation won't change for 20 years. And the original translation of our verse isn't that they turned back to God. It was actually that they lamented to God. That they cried out to God as a result of two decades of pain and suffering. We have a word for what Israel tried to do here. And that term is repentance. And if you don't know what repentance means, at its basic definition, it means turning back to God. But what the Israelites are going to find out pretty quickly is that as simple as repentance seems, that it's really easy to get it wrong. And this is where Samuel steps in. So let's read verse 3 together. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel is, at this moment, acknowledging that they have at least attempted to repent. He says, if you're returning to the Lord, if you're serious about this, I just want you to know you're doing it wrong. I asked you at the beginning, what if there was something that could keep you from getting the most out of your faith simply because you did it wrong? Well, I think as we look at this passage today, we're going to see that the answer to that question is repentance. So I want to ask you, what if you've been doing it wrong? What if you have kept yourself from the best version of yourself simply because you misunderstood repentance? And this is the idea that I want to focus on today. And if you're a note taker, this is something I want you to write down. The idea that we're going to focus on today is that if you miss the point of repentance, you will miss the power of God. And I think this is why Samuel focuses so heavily on this idea. Because Israel, they have been expectant of the power of God. They expected to be delivered from the Philistines and to see their situation change. But for 20 years, nothing different happens simply because they did it wrong. And so Samuel dedicates himself here to teaching them how to do it right. And that's what I want to do today. I want to talk to you about three observations that we're going to make about repentance that might just change the way you look at it. And my prayer is that as we walk away today that you'll apply these to your lives, whether that's for the first time or if it's just taking next steps in them, and that we will see God change our lives in some ways that we never even imagined were possible. So the first uh, first observation we're going to make is that repentance is prioritization. And here's what I mean by this, is there is a level of depth and intimacy, and closeness that we can reach with God through repentance. But a big part of repentance is an understanding that we have to get our priorities right. So when Israel repented for the first time, their mistake wasn't that they didn't turn back to God. It was simply that they did not have their priorities right. So they worshipped God, but they also worshipped other gods. And look at what Samuel says to him in verses 3 and 4. We're going to read these together. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their balls and their Ashtoreths, and they served the Lord only. So what Samuel's doing here is he's saying, hey, again, if you're serious about this, if you really want to repent, then what you've got to do is you've got to take the balls and the asterisks, all these foreign gods, and you've got to get rid of them. Because God was not interested in being just an addition 
to Israel's worship. And he wasn't even interested in being worshipped more than the other gods. It was that Israel would worship God alone, that they would serve God only. And I think we struggle with the same thing sometimes. I think for a lot of us, myself included, sometimes we struggle to serve only God. Most of you in this room, if I asked you if you have any idols in your life, you would pretty confidently look at me and go, no. But the reality is, is for every single one of us, we have things in our life that if we're not careful, they can take the place of God. Things like work and busyness and kids and relationships and school and sports and all these things. And if we're not careful, what we end up with are either idols that completely take the place of God or we end up trying to do this balancing act where we take our schedules and we take God and we try to kind of work our schedules around God and we try to work God into our schedules and we struggle and we struggle and all we're doing is trying to get God into first place in our lives. But the reality is, is that God doesn't want to win the race for first place. God wants to own the track. And what I mean by that is that God is not interested in competing for our attention. God wants our attention and our affection Because it already belonged to him. God deserves our devotion because we are his creation. We have to be careful that we don't just make God an addition to what's going on in our lives. Israel wanted God in their lives, but God wanted to be the center of their life. And I think we struggle with that too sometimes. I think everybody in here wants to put God in their lives. But sometimes we don't want to put God at the center of it. And I think we've seen this a lot lately. I think we see where we fight for prayer in schools, but not all of us are fighting for prayer in our homes. Or we'll vote for Christian politicians to lead our nation, but we don't make it a priority to lead our family spiritually. God has to become the priority. It's not that he just gets added into our lives. And I want you to understand that the motives behind those things are not bad. But the point of repentance isn't that we add God into it. It's that he becomes everything. And that's a distinction that I want to make sure that we make, that we understand that when it came to Israel, God didn't just need to be in their life. He had to be their life. He had to be everything to them. And so for us, we need to understand that repentance is not just worshiping God. That's a big part of it. But the main point of repentance is that our focus and our devotion would shift entirely to him. You know, Hannah and I have almost been married for two years now. It's one month away, July 24th. Marriage, if you're not married, let me just say 10 out of 10 would recommend. It's pretty cool. But marriage is also, it is a sacred commitment that when I put that ring on her finger and I spoke my vows to her, I said, I am devoting myself entirely to you. You have everything of me until death do us part. So if one day, let's just say, I decide I'm going to cheat on her and I walk up to her and I say, hey, honey. I just wanted to let you know that I've been sleeping with another woman. But I wanted to put you at ease about it. I sleep with her once a week, but I am really devoted to you the other six. I would not be married anymore because that's not how marriage works. And that's not how our relationship with God works either. We don't get to benefit from the experience of a relationship with God without the devotion to God. And it's not that God wants some of our devotion. It's not that God wants most of our devotion. It's that he gets all of our devotion. So where do your priorities need to shift? Maybe for some of you, doing things like coming to church isn't a priority. You come when it's convenient, when nothing else is going on. Or maybe you like to watch online because it's just easier not to put pants on and drive 10 minutes down the road. I get it. Maybe your prayer life looks more like an afterthought than a focus. Maybe your life has become so consumed with everything else that you do struggle to find time for God. Maybe 
you have more of a priority of preaching politics on Facebook than you do sharing the love of Jesus. Or maybe you're in this room and you have real idols in your life. You're not serving Baal or Ashtoreth, but you have the idol of pornography. Or maybe you are consumed by the identity that you find in your success. Maybe money's an idol for you. And you're scared to let go of it. Or maybe you struggle with alcohol or with drugs. I want to encourage you that for the idols, cut them out. Don't even give them a foothold in your life. Do whatever you have to. Yes, pray to God, but seek counseling. Find accountability partners. Attend support groups. Do whatever you have to to cut those idols out of your life. God has to become the priority in our life, and we have to learn to make him one. Not just because we have to or because we're commanded to, but because there is a beauty and an intimacy and a power that we receive from a relationship with God, and we develop that closeness as we make him a priority. Now, the second observation we'll make about repentance is that repentance is a posture. Samuel wanted Israel to understand that repentance was not just an action, that yes, they would work to remove physical sin from their lives, but they also needed to understand that they had spiritual needs. Look at verses 5 and 6 with me. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew out water and they poured it out before the Lord. And on that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. So Samuel tells them, Okay, you're serious about repenting. So what you're going to do is you're going to go gather at Mizpah. And this was not just some central location for them. It was not an easy place to gather. Mizpah held historical significance to them. It was the same place where all the way back in Genesis 31, Jacob separates from Laban. And it's also the same place that in Judges 20, where a repentant Israel gathered before God. So for them, they look at this place historically as a place of separation, but also a place of repentance. And so as Israel gathers before God at Mizpah, they are trying to show that they understand that they are in need of God and that they're willing to submit to him fully. And that's a big distinction to make about repentance for us, that repentance is not just an action. Repentance is not us just muscling our way out of sin and into spiritual living. But sometimes we think that because we made the mistakes in our life, because we made this mess, that we have to be the ones to clean it up. And we need to do it our way. But that's not how it works. The strength to overcome sin and the power to experience life change comes only from a dependence on God, not by doing it our way. What good has doing it our way ever gotten us? Doing it our way led us into sin in the first place. And that's exactly what Israel does right here at the beginning, is Israel, they try to fix things by their own way. They think they have the answers, and they do two things. They end up bringing themselves back into sin, but they experience no change in their life, and they experience pain for 20 years. So I think it's worth asking, what do you want the next 20 years of your life to look like? Do you want it to look like Israel's where there's pain and frustration and mourning? Or do you want it to look like what it could look like with freedom and joy and life change? We can do things our own way. We can end up just like Israel did at the beginning of this story. Or we can experience life change as we do things God's way and by his strength. Now the first thing that Israel does when they get to Mizpah is they're going to pour out water before God. And there's a symbolic act here that was supposed to symbolize that they were pouring out their souls before God. And what this was supposed to show was a couple of things. It was supposed to show that they were emptied out before God. That they were an empty vessel. That they understood that they were in need. They messed up, and they needed a Savior. But it was also supposed to show there was nothing left to hide. And as they poured out this water, two things would follow. Israel would fast, 
and they would confess their sins. Now, fasting was intended to show that nothing else in this moment mattered to them more than getting right with God. They knew that the answer to their problems in life, they knew that to fix their situation, they had to fix their relationship with God. So they were going to be willing to do whatever it took in order to accomplish that. And the confession showed two things. It showed a recognition of their sin, but it also showed an owning of their sin, that they knew, yes, we are sinners, And we need God. And that was a big turning point for Israel. Because I want to remind you that these are the same people that at the beginning of the story thought they had all of the answers and all of the solutions. But as they find themselves now before God at Mizpah, they can draw two conclusions. That they're sinners and that they need God. And they were willing to submit completely to him. And we have to get to that same point in our lives. If you want to see your life and your relationship with God grow and flourish, it happens by a posture of repentance. That we would learn to stand before God and confess our sins and submit completely to him. And I don't just mean being generic. We need to be specific with God. That we could look at him and when we say, hey, I struggle with lust, we're really trying to say, God, I have a porn addiction. And don't just say that you have a short temper. Tell God that you struggle with lashing out at your loved ones in anger. Don't tell God that you like to play the comparison game when you're a habitual coveter. We need to learn to pour ourselves out before God and be open with him, just like Israel did. Because it's in that openness that we find the freedom and forgiveness that we've been searching for. I want to show you what can happen if you have a posture of repentance before God. Look at verses 7 through 11 with me. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hands of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth So what happens here is that Israel is gathered to pray and the Philistines find them and they think this is a moment of weakness. So they say, go for it, attack. The the Israelites, they notice this from a distance and they're afraid, but something's changed with Israel here. Notice how they respond. They turn to Samuel and they say, don't stop praying. Pray that God would deliver us. And this is a stark contrast to their last battle where they took things into their own hands. But as Israel finds themselves in a posture of repentance, they rely on God entirely to win the battle. And I want you to know what happens, that as Samuel offers his burnt offering and prays, his prayer was already answered. That as the Philistines attacked, the Lord thundered against them, caused them to panic, and they flee. And the Israelites chase after them and slaughter the Philistines bringing peace to Israel for the first time in 20 years. That happens because they relied on God. You know, when I interviewed at my last church to be their student pastor, they took me for my final step. I got to go with them for a week to the beach, which, by the way, if you're interviewing someone and you really want them to like you, take them to the beach, not a bad idea. But I had ninth grade boys. That was who I was over. And they wanted to hang out with the ninth grade girls. Shocker. But we would take a lot of our free time and we would go down to the beach. And one day in particular, they decided they wanted to swim out to the second sandbar. Well, if you know anything about the ocean, there's currents. And today was a really strong current. And what I didn't know is that one of the girls that was with us had a heart condition. It wasn't a lethal heart condition, but what it did was that anytime she went through strenuous activity, it tired her to the point that her muscles really didn't work anymore. So swimming out there wasn't that big of a deal because the current carries you out. We play around for a little bit, but on the way back in, it's the current strong, so you're fighting against it. So for those of us that were strong swimmers, this wasn't really a big deal. But about halfway back, I hear four words come from behind me. Chris, I need help. And I turn, and this girl 
had been fighting her way back, but she got so tired that she's now chin deep in water and she's sinking. So I turn as fast as I can and I swim back to her. I grab onto her and I say, put your arm around me. So we grab onto each other and we just proceed to shimmy our way through the ocean a couple of inches at a time. Thankfully, we made it back to shore. The girl was perfectly fine. Nothing happened. But things could have gone a lot differently if she had chosen to do it her way. She would have drowned. But instead of fighting through it, she chose to rely on someone who was strong enough to carry her out of there. Well, the same thing's true for us. Are you going to fight your sins and your struggles your way? Or are you going to rely on the one who's strong enough to carry you through them? We find our victory in a posture of repentance. That we would be able to confess our sins and acknowledge our weakness and submit fully to God. And the last observation we'll make today is that repentance is a process. And sometimes I think we hear that word and we kind of groan a little bit because we think something long and drawn out and exhausting has to follow that word. But I think that that can be an encouraging word in the story of our faith. Look at verse 12 with me. I said, then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin, and he named it Ebenezer, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. So Samuel, as he sets this stone up, understands that Israel has found victory because of their repentance. But he also understands that the fight is far from over, that there is a lot of progress to be made. And the same thing is true for us. Repentance is not a single act that we commit. It is a lifetime commitment and a lifestyle of fixing our priorities and our posture before God. And this may come as a shocker to you, but none of you, including myself, are going to walk away today a flawless example of godly living. Every single one of us are works in progress. And guess what? We have to work towards progress. But the beauty of the process is that our mistakes, they're not the end of the story that we get to get up and keep going. And there's something else that's cool about it. Look at the meaning of Ebenezer here. It says, thus far, the Lord has helped us. That we're not alone in this. That as we draw near to God by making him a priority, and as we find ourselves in a posture of repentance, I want to remind you that there's an intimacy and a closeness that we develop with God. And that he is walking with us every single step of the way. So the moments that we fall, he picks us up. And the moments we don't feel like going any further, he pushes us on. Repentance is going to be a process. It is going to be our life. But it's worth seeing what the end result is as God works on us. So how do we respond today to the story of Samuel and Israelites' repentance? I think it's simple. I think we draw near to God. All three of our observations today can be summed up in that simple application because that's the point of repentance. Ultimately, that we would find ourselves closer to God and not just further away from sin. And I don't want you to miss that because remember, if you miss the point of repentance, you'll miss the power of God. If you want to experience life change, if you want to experience real change, you find it when you draw near to God. So let me ask you, where do you need to draw near to him? What areas of repentance do you struggle with? Maybe you do struggle with making God a priority. And you know that you need to work to make him the center of your life. Or maybe you do have idols that you need to cut out. Or maybe you're here and you're just tired of trying to do things your own way. You're tired of fighting through it. And you want to rely on him. Or maybe for the first time in your life, you realize that you need to repent. And you've never taken that first step. And today's the day to do that. I want to encourage you that whatever step it is, take it. Make God the priority. Remove the idols. Rely on him. Draw near to God. Because scripture tells us that if we draw near to him, he draws near to us. And there is a beauty that we develop in that relationship as we develop a closeness with him. You have a friend who got married a couple of years ago in North Carolina, and her wedding ended up going viral on social media. Her and her husband decided they were going to do a first look, and they got each other gifts. Well, her husband is colorblind. And I don't know if you've seen anything about these, but she got him a pair of these color-correcting sunglasses. And if you don't know how they work, they're really cool. You pick the specific type of color blindness that they deal with, and these glasses actually work to correct the color. And so it'll fix the blended shades, or it'll fix the hues that are messed up. 
So he opens his gift, and naturally he's a little confused at first as to why she got him a pair of sunglasses, but she motions for him to put them on his face. And you watch this look of amazement fall over him as he stares at the trees and the sky and the flowers and his bride. And this grown man is moved to tears because he experiences color in a way that he never has before. Well, I think the same thing's true of repentance. That if we would move closer to God in repentance, that we'll learn to experience God in ways that we never have. And that is a beautiful truth. So don't miss out on the life change that's possible with him. Don't miss the point of repentance. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Let's pray.